It's hard, frankly, when you're a reporter who's covered wars and natural disasters, man-made disruptions and thrilling feats by human beings, and also the horror that man and nature can sometimes deliver. It is hard to stand by and report and not act. Recently, I was shooting in the Congo, doing a series that uh, recently aired on the PBS NewsHour. Uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, to um, examine that history of that country's last uh, couple of decades and current day history as well. Our reporting took us to schools where former victims of sex trafficking and former child soldiers were enrolled to learn new skills, cosmetology and auto repair and plumbing. We told the story of a fledgling film school run by Congolese who are working hard to draft a, a new script, a new narrative for their country that has been, as you know, embroiled in civil war for decades now. A country that is gloriously rich in natural resources, which has made it a target of colonial powers first, and then militias and looters and unscrupulous foreign business interests. Uh, we also told the story, and this is a, a video that I'll share with you in just a minute, um, of Varunga National Park. You saw some pictures just a moment ago. Uh, the eastern part of the DRC, bordering Rwanda and Uganda, spanning thousands of acres of Varunga, is Africa's oldest national park. And the man who runs the park is a guy named Emmanuel de Merod. He's literally a Belgian prince who has risked his life and been shot, actually, a couple of times and lost many of his park rangers as well, all to protect Virunga National Park. He took me to visit uh, a gorilla orphanage where they care for the gorillas whose parents, as you've seen in that previous photo, have been killed by poachers. Here's what he told me. Take a look. Where are we right now? This is the, the walls of the orphanage. So this is the Senkwekwe Center. Um, so it's a sanctuary that we built a few years ago with the help of, of Howard Buffett. It was built to provide a home for the mountain gorillas that were rescued after these terrible massacres that happened in 2007. And these orphans, will they live in here forever or do they go out into the, the bigger habitat at some point? You know, the ideal thing would be to reintroduce them into their natural habitat so that they can live a complete life as wild gorillas. But that may not be possible for all sorts of reasons. They may find it impossible to adapt back into the natural world. What can gorillas teach us? Well, there's an enormous amount, and it's not just the science. They're the, the window, in a sense, to relaunching a healthy economy in this region, thanks to the tourism industry that's developing. But in themselves, they're absolutely wonderful animals. Um, there's nothing quite like the mountain gorillas, because they're so powerful, but they're incredibly gentle by nature. Their whole ecology and their whole social structure is, is very family-based and they take on the very gentle side of primate life, in a sense. And so because of that, we were able to spend a lot of time with them um, because they welcome human beings into their groups. And over the years, we've developed a very rich literature, a very rich um, scientific knowledge on gorilla ecology, gorilla social systems that actually teach us a lot about ourselves. How close is a, is a gorilla to a human being? In terms of their genetics, right. they're about 98 percent the same as we are. Um, and so it's just an accident of evolution that we, that we are here and that they're here. They, of course, tend to take the more positive aspects of our condition. Um, and we tend to um, sometimes be more destructive. And it's that destruction that is threatening the mountain gorilla. The mountain gorillas um, rep could be, represent, I guess, a core of what could be uh, the rebirth of tourism in both the DRC and the Republic of Congo, as now um, really both are seeing that protecting those gorillas could be in their economic best interest. And so I want to pull up the Google expedition that was done on the mountain gorillas of the neighboring Republic of Congo, who are protected by the efforts of the Wildlife Conservation Society staff of about 300 people. Take a look at that. 
They don't just protect the gorillas from poachers, they help the community manage the valuable natural asset. They do ecological monitoring, scientific research, environmental education. And it's not just the gorillas. Uh, Congo's Noabale Ndoko Park is home to elephants and chimpanzees and antelope and other endangered mammals as well. Because of actions being taken, it's very possible, as you can see, to get close to these uh, mountain gorillas in their own habitat. We saw them nursing their babies, obviously playing in the lush jungle on vines and on branches. Um, you might see uh, wearing a surgical mask because, of course, humans, uh, they're worried that humans will infect the, the mountain gorilla's fragile uh, immune system. The biggest threat, of course, comes from the poachers who destroy the mountain gorilla's habitat because they want to exploit the forest for wood or for coal. And there is sometimes a theory, they believe that if they're able to kill all the mountain gorillas, that maybe the park rangers would have nothing to protect and they would just go away. The efforts, in fact, of the park rangers, both in the Republic of Congo and the DRC, um, while costing many lives, have been successful. The endangered mountain gorillas are making a, a comeback. The population has increased 50% and now stands at nearly 400 gorillas, an extraordinary rise when you consider uh, the gorillas' naturally low reproductive rate. The mountains themselves are very steep and a challenging climb, makes it difficult to track these gorillas in the wild. For us in the DRC, it was about two days of travel and then a, a four-hour hike up a mountain so steep you had to hold onto trees to make your way up. So a big thank you to the photographers because remember, they're hauling all the gear up that mountain to shoot and uh, it was no joke. Expeditions can give you, of course, as you just saw, a sense of what it's really like to experience the mountain gorillas, not just look at a, a shot of them, but to experience. And of course, as a reporter, it makes me feel that all of you um, get to see the luxury of the job that I'm both blessed and honored to have. What's the experience of being there? And are we more interested in these gorillas because we're dropped right into their habitat instead of me lecturing you about gorillas with a slide. Clearly, expeditions can be an amazing way to engage and, frankly, enthrall students, especially those who maybe haven't had an opportunity to travel a lot or will never have an opportunity to travel a lot. They can literally experience what it's like using Google Cardboard, which I know many of you have already tried. It's beautiful, it's immersive, it's entertaining, it's fascinating, and it's a great way to learn about something with no context or understanding that you need to bring to it. And while I see a tremendous opportunity for Google Expedition, my own work with students, we send girls to and through college, had me wondering, could you do an expedition, not on a, a place like the Congo, but on a person's life? My husband and I started a foundation in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, which I had covered a lot as a reporter, and we found so many needy young women who had pretty much been left with zero resources that we knew we could have a pretty big impact if we could send a handful of girls to and through college. We provide them with wraparound services, get them mentors and internships and summer jobs, all with the goal of getting them through college. We call it the Starfish Foundation after the starfish story, which some of you may know. The starfish story was told to me by a bunch of missionaries in Haiti when I was covering the earthquake. And I remember at one point opening the back of a box truck and inside were swaddled babies and they were all dying. And I said to these missionaries, how do you do this job every day? How do you, how do, you do this every single day when there's no light at the end of the tunnel? How do you know you're doing the right thing when you could just pack up and go home? And they used to say to me, it's a starfish story. I was like, well, I don't know what that is. What's a starfish story? So the starfish story, you know, the tide's gone out, a bunch of starfish have been beached on the sand, and a boy starts walking along the beach, picking up starfish and chucking them back into the water. And a man comes up to him and says, what are you doing? This beach goes on for miles. There are literally a million starfish on the sand. This is a complete waste of time. And the kid picks up a starfish and says, eh, I guess it matters to this one, chucks it in. And the moral of the story, of course, is one is plenty motive to do what you need to do. And so, of course, for us, we realized pretty quickly that our scholars could be the starfish and that our goal wasn't to rescue millions of them, but every year to send 25 young women to and through school. It was doable, it was tangible, but as we discovered, as we work with these young women and hundreds more now, um, they all had one thing in common, 
and that was that their dreams were this big. This, they couldn't imagine anything for themselves. We have one young woman who is a chemistry and computer science double major, and the only job she had ever had in four years of school was working at IHOP. Never occurred to her that there was something that she could do as a summer job. Uh, another young woman who's a senior now, who's a math major at Denison, when I suggested, well, wow, as a math major, maybe you could get a job in finance, she looked at me and said, what's finance? Their experience is this big. So I asked the expedition team at Google, so could you do an expedition into someone's life? Could you do an expedition into someone's career? So here's an expedition into the career of Pam Torrell. She's a pilot. We'll just show you one uh, frame of what we've done with her. Her family was always devoted to flying. You can see her down here. Her dad was a pilot for United Airlines, and her mom is 81 years old and still flies for fun, which is both great and terrifying that she's flying. Um, Pam got her interest very young, she said. She would go on uh, scenic rides in a flying club as a kid, and her advice to young women and men who want to be pilots is to pursue a degree in aviation and get plenty of flight time, because it's going to be mandatory down the road. Uh, we have a series of photos where we show, 360 photos, you can use them with your Google Cardboard, where you show every kind of interaction she has with the air traffic control, measuring location and distance and uh, speed of the aircraft, and Pam working on the exterior of her plane, looking for leaks and scratches and dents, all of these things that she does because we wanted to show an expedition into Pam's love of flying. Most of the young women that we deal with, and some of the young men too, who come out of poverty and are probably the first in their families to graduate from high school, much less go on to college. They don't know anybody who's a pilot. They might not have ever been on a plane. They don't have the first idea of who you could possibly call to ask what you would possibly need to do to go be a pilot. We believe this is an opportunity to bring the experience of these careers to young men and women who want to experience what it's like. Sometimes a need for action is to immerse someone within the action so that they can develop a, a passion for an experience or a, a career that they had no knowledge of before. And I'm proud to be a pioneer in the first uh, career expeditions. I hope you'll have a chance to check them all out. We know that um, it's not just enough to get students to the door of college. You have to get them to and through and help them discover all the options that are out there that exist in life that they've never been exposed to. And if it's in life, then that means that you can do an expedition around it. And we know students can be what they can see. Expedition has the power not only to bring images to students, of course, young and older students, but if you immerse them so that they feel like they can be in the Congo, or they could be a pilot, potentially, then you truly have the opportunity to change a life. Thank you very much.